morning. Good morning.
life is good thing when you stay married. I didn't see that in my house. So I'm pretty skeptical when you tell me something's supposed to be what it's supposed to be. I'm like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so I, the skepticism comes out at work too. When you tell me things, I'm kind of, hmm, I don't know about that. I got to think about that. Uh, we're independent. See, I was at home by myself, letting myself in, cooking a snack, making things, doing what I needed to do. Being independent and responsible. I didn't need somebody to say, girl, go straight home. Open that door. I knew how to do it. I did what I was supposed to do. So I'm very independent thinking. I can do things on my own. I can finish stuff. I can get it done. All of that. I'm casual and unwavering. Because of the way we grew up, we understand all that prim and proper stuff y'all talking about, and dress up and look nice and do all that. What's underneath that? Is it a lie? Are you showing me a lie? Be real. We're, we're, we're casual. We're OK with that. Okay? So we're okay with being casual and we're unwavering. When we stand on something, we stand on it. That's what we mean. We're adaptable. We can, we can change. We understand when things have to have to have to change. We're not, we're not rigid in our work and we want good work-life balance. We've seen people who work like a dog and then they end up with nothing at the end of their life. They're sick. They've given everything they have to work and they have nothing to give to their families. We see our mothers. Our single mothers out there working two and three jobs. So to us, we're saying, look, I'm not doing that. I got to find a job that I can make enough money in to live because I need to be able to live with that little check that I'm bringing home. Meaning go out, have fun, travel, have vacation, do great things. So when you see a Generation X person say, well, I'm, I'm gone for the day, you get mad. They need to stay a little bit longer. No, you stay a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Groom <laughs> somebody behind you so that that place that you are in doesn't fall apart when you leave. Stop being hoarders of work. Stop doing that. Don't hoard everything. Give freely of yourself to other people and give these people more responsibility. We are ready. People are poor, 50 something years old. They're ready to do these jobs. Opportunities for advancement. We want to move up. We want to be vice presidents. We want to be the president. We can do it now because we're, we're intelligent, we're educated, we're there, we're ready. So give us those opportunities and respect our time. Generation Xers, our time is valuable. Remember I told you, we want to be at work, we want to make the most of that day, and then we want to go home and have fun, be with our families, do what we didn't see done for us. We're going to do that for our families, and we want that healthy work-life balance. So don't waste a lot of our time with, with routine, I guess I'd say um, ineffective meetings, which a lot of you. <laughs> how to lead us? How do we need to be led and managed? So when you tell when you tell extras, um, here's what needs to be done. You can tell the team what needs to be done, but individuals need to know what's expected of them. Because remember, I've been at home by myself with the key, I let myself in, I understand that I need to know what do you want Chandra to do in the context of the team. So they need more, a little bit more granularity to things than just this kind of global picture. They need to know what is expected of them. And don't overpraise us. 
Because I may be faking. Oh, they're just trying to get me to do something. They just want something. Yeah. I'm gonna, that skepticism comes out. So if you overpraise, we don't need that. I know I'm good. I know I'm good at what I do, right? Now that might sound cocky to you, but I'm confident because I've had to do it before and I've seen the outcomes of it. So you can't snow me. You can't, you can't, um, you can't snow me. Oh, y'all, what am I doing? <laughs> Help me, man, over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when you don't know how to do something, ask the generation that can help us figure this out. Reward soon after the award-worthy accomplishment. You better tell me that day I did good. Let me go to talk about, I'm going to give you a check, I'm going to give you a bonus for what, I, what? Tell me now. They want, right then, say you did a great job. Um, prefer email of, over other modes of communication. So now. Think about this. If I'm skeptical, I want it in writing. Put that in writing because I want to make sure I go back, look at it again, and remind you. Remember what you said? Right? <laughs> That's the skepticism. So how you communicate with me, it's better in email. All right? All right. So the Generation Y. So their characteristics, and these are a couple of my Generation Yers here, Alicia um, and, and uh, Ashley. So some of their characteristics, they're very tech web savvy. They're very family oriented. See what has happened with the, the Y generation, and this is my opinion, and some of the literature says this too. Because extras were so neglected, and I come on so I can say it, we were so neglected, we are not going to neglect our children. We're doing our very best not to neglect them. We're trying to make sure we have family meals, we have things together, and even if we're separated from our spouses, we try to make sure we keep our families together and that they spend time together. So again, they're ambitious, they're team players. They're great communicators. These, these folks are great communicators because they, they know what it feels like to not know something. And they're going to ask you because they don't want to mess up. And you might say, well, they get on my nerves. They just ask too many questions. Get over it. Answer their questions. If they ask you some of the same things like, over and over, it's try they're trying to understand. These people are very wise in the way that they approach work, and I love working with them. They are hungry. They're eager. They're ready to do whatever you need them to do but they need us to pour into them and direct them. You can't just say, come in here and try to figure it out. You can't figure it out. You have to tell them and help them and guide them. And the way we do that is we, we give them the attention they need. See, if you don't have time to lead people and manage people, step down. Let somebody get in that role that has the time to lead and cultivate people. Because it's more than just you walking in and saying, well, I'm, I'm the head, I'm the, I'm the boss. It's more than that. It's about what do you need for me to be successful. One of the things I try to do with this group, my Generation Y folks, is I do a project with everybody. I do something that takes us about three months to get done. And the reason I do that is because I need to understand how you communicate, I need to understand what you need from me, and I need to understand how you deliver things. So um, one of the ones that the projects that we're doing right now is we're doing focus groups around some of the challenges we had on our employee engagement survey. So people said, you don't give me enough rewards and recognition, and I don't get to do learning and development at UT. So what we did was, can y'all still hear me? Mm -hmm. So what we did was, um, we called three focus groups together. And I told these, I told my um, millennials, I said, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write, I want you to go research focus groups. So they had to go research focus groups. What is a focus group? How do you get a focus group together? What are some questions you ask in a focus group? What are we going to, what do we need from people? What do we want to learn from them? They had to go do the research. They had to explain that to me. And then they had to execute the focus groups. It took us about three months to do that. And I got to see, were they able to research? I got to teach them something, right? And then I got to be able to kind of shape what I wanted that to look like. So now I know what are they good at, what, where do I need to shore them up, and what is it that I need to, to produce within this group of folks? These people love attention. So what I do is I go to everybody's office at least a couple times a week, and I sit there and I say, hey, Debbie, what's going on? What's happening in your world? They like to know that you're thinking about them and that you have them on your mind because they, they want to make sure they're pleasing you. Remember, they're a craving attention. But they are prone to job hopping. I'm going to tell you how I solved that one. I'm going to tell you this next screen. 
So um, what do we look at millennials? We have to understand who they are, first of all. So coming into a job, sometimes you don't know exactly what you want to do. You're not really sure what path you want to take. You need somebody to guide you and help you figure out what you're good at. That's why when you're working with them on projects and you're working, you can say, man, you're really good at this. So I have Fawn here, and this is um, uh, Gabrielle. So Fawn and Gabrielle, they came to us from the University of Memphis, and uh, Gabrielle came from Target. She had worked at Target for eight years uh, as in HR. And Fawn had worked at the University of Memphis for about four years in HR. They were wanting to um, give, they wanted the opportunity to learn and grow. They wanted to be able to move up. They want to look for personal engagement opportunities. Gabrielle came to us, and um, in her first couple of years, she was a recruiter. So after she moved into kind of a management role for us, we had to have the we had to have some opportunities for her to to branch out. She has her bachelor's degree. She's working on her master's degree, encouraging her to go and to get more education, encouraging her to get certifications in her field. It's very important because they're going to be leading HR. How are you going to lead HR? You don't even have a certification. You love it so much, but you ain't certified in it. If you love something, do more in that field. Encourage them to do that. Encourage them to get more opportunities. Look for personal engagement opportunities for them. Always send them to conferences, to things that I know that they're going to help them grow. Do this for your millennials. They, sometimes they won't come to you and ask you for something because they don't know. You research it. See, being a, being a supervisor is not a lackadaisical job. It's a real job. It's the little coins you get paid, the little coins you get paid to do it mean something. You are supposed to be groping people. You are supposed to be helping people. You are supposed to be advantaging them, not just clocking in every day and seeing if they at work. You are supposed to build them up. So we have to do that. Um, also working with them, this is Debbie Long here. Debbie, Debbie Long. So Debbie came to work with me, with me from a, like a, a little HR office of two. So when she came to us, we have 20 on our team. So she came to a bigger staff. And when she came to me, she worked at the front desk for a year. She said, Shonda, I'm tired of working at the front desk. I want to do something different. I said, you want to do something different? I said, OK, we're going to figure out something different for you to do. So I had read about something in this HR exam that I took. It's called job swapping. Job swapping. So I said, you know what? I think I'm going to practice that with Debbie and see if I can swap her job with somebody. She said she was tired of being at the front desk. So I said, I had an opening kind of similar to hers in benefits. She was in what was called talent management or recruitment. And so I said, I'm going to move her to benefits. Then she can learn a whole new job in benefits. And she would stay with me for about another year, maybe, or two, right? So I, I got ready to swap Debbie, and I had to have somebody to swap her with. So I had another young lady named Sierra, and I said, Sierra, she was in benefits. So those were the two I wanted to swap. So I went to Sierra, I said, Sierra. Uh, Debbie wants to, Debbie's tired of doing employment. Are you tired of doing benefits? She said, no, I love benefits. I want to stay in benefits. I said, Sierra, you really do? I said, I, I couldn't believe it. Because it's not that big, it, it's so paperwork heavy and it's not fun at all. I mean, to me. But anyway, <laughs> I guess it was safe. But anyway, so uh, she didn't want to swap. So I said, all right, it's not going to work. So I found another place to put her, a place called Employee Relations. So I moved her to that and she found her love there. She found that she is really good at training people. Her platform skills, she has them. She could be up here talking to y'all, no problem. We put her in employee relations. She did a lot of the training there. She did a lot of the development work there. And then Sierra came to me. You know what Sierra said? I'm tired of being in benefits now. <laughs> <laughs> when I planted that seed in her mind, it took her three months to figure out I am tired of it. But remember, Generation Y, they don't always come to work thinking about what I'm going to do with it. But when Sierra came to me, she said, I'm ready to switch now. So I moved her to employment. Debbie moved over to benefits, but brought some of that IO psychology. We figured out she's going to major in IO psychology. She went to Austin P, got her IO psychology degree, and now she's managing all of our training and learning and development on campus. We have to create opportunities for people where we see them flourishing. If you and your purview can do that for people, they will stay with you. Now, they won't be able to, they won't be able to stay with me through our whole IO psychology career because I can't afford to pay her what they make in reality. But what I can do is create a great foundation. So when she leaves me and she goes to get that six-figure job, she's ready for it, right? She's ready for it and she's not in any way inhibited. She's not afraid. She has all the skills she needs and she has all the development that I can give her to move her to that next level. So really thinking about how you can give people a chance to be their best self. 
we have to show authenticity and uniqueness for as well. See, I have to be real. When they come to me, I can say, I don't have an opportunity for you right now, but I'm gonna try to create something. Let's see what we can come up with together. Let's look at our landscape and see what we have. And when you're honest with them and you don't have something, they still respect you. And they won't just drop you and walk out the door. They'll say, Shonda, I wanna stay as long as I can to help bring the person along that's gonna come after me. So we have to be creating these types of opportunities for people. And we do have to offer flexible jobs that fit within their life. Now that's kind of easy for communicators and IT folks. It's harder for custodians. It's harder for people who are who are in fields with uh, dental hygienists. I have a whole bunch of dental hygienists in our college of dentistry. They have to be at work. You can't, you can't be in somebody's mouth at your house. <laughs> but we can offer some perks, we can offer some benefits, we can give them some, some time and attention and professional development that they might otherwise not get. All right, so leading these folks, creating opportunities to bond, I'm telling you, they love being with their supervisor, they love talking to me, they love when I come to their office, <clears throat> they love when we spend time together. They want you to tell it like it is. If you don't have money to give me any money, say that, don't just, Say, I'm gonna try to get you a raise. I'm gonna try to get you a raise. I, don't, we can't, I can't do it right now. And I might not be able to do it for the next year. When we hit COVID, I had three people that I had switched to a new job. I was letting them try something. They were like, try before you die. I let my people do that. I let them try a job before they actually say they wanna do it. Now, I have the flexibility to do that. But here's the thing when they were trying that job, I said, as soon as y'all like it, we're gonna change your job description. We're gonna change the pay. We'll make that happen. COVID hit. We laid off 70 people. How is that gonna give somebody a raise when we laying off 70 people? But they gonna let you do that. No, they're not letting me. I'm laying off 70 people, right? And I'm gonna give you a raise. So what did I have to say to them? I can't do it. I can't do it. When I was truthful to them, they stayed in those jobs though. They kept working hard for me. They kept working because I had to tell it like it was. We're in a situation where we don't have enough to work for people. We, have, we were the only institution in the state that did that. It was embarrassing. But my team knew up front what was happening. People need to be, you need to be as transparent as you can with these new teams. They need to understand why you're making the decisions you're making, why you're not moving forward with things that you said you were going to do. What has happened in the landscape that made you have to turn your, to, to, to not do what you said you were going to do? They understand. But we have to tell them. We hide behind things like our titles. We hide behind, I can make the decision. I don't have to tell them anything. We hide behind, that's not gonna work for this new generation. Because I'm gonna tell you, if you've seen, um, if you've seen this new, uh, uh, on TikTok, they have this thing, it's called Salary Transparent Street. There is a girl that's doing a study on TikTok. And she says, I'm a program administrator at so and so, so and so. I make seventy thousand dollars. How much do you make? <clears throat> They're on TikTok telling their salaries <laughs> that we told them not to tell. <laughs> they don't care what you are. They don't care about your policies. They don't care about your rules. They're going to make their own rules. And if we don't get in, get in front of that by asking them, what can I do? What can I do to make it more, what can I do to make your workplace more tolerable? What will make you stay? What do you need from me to be successful? We have to do that. We have to ask these hard questions that we think we don't care to know. But you better care to know, or you'll be sitting there by yourself doing all the work, because they're gonna be gone. Being TikTok agents. We're <laughs> <laughs> gonna be sitting there, the IT program, doing all the newsletters ourselves, writing all the media reports. You have to start grooming people in a way that they want to be groomed. You have to ask them what will make you stay. You have to pay them fairly. You have to share job descriptions. You have to do all these things that we aren't used to doing. We were told to hide all that. We were told don't tell anybody about that. Don't let people know that. That's over. Um, let me make sure I say everything on that slide. Where's my name over here? Coaching is so 
so important. And if you've never coached before, read some coaching articles, read some coaching books, because they need us to do that. Coaching is different than managing. It's almost like cheerleading, and you're giving them assignments, and you're, you're, you're encouraging them through that. Give lots of feedback. Every time one of my team members does something, I try to go to all their, their speeches or workshops or whatever they're, they're, they're delivering, and I call them immediately and say, I was there, I loved it, here's the part I loved about it. I don't give shallow feedback. It was good. That was great. I try to give them an, an, an example of why I thought it was so good. I try to be very specific in my praise and my feedback, and I try to be very liberal with it. Every day I see something. I, I got an email note. Um, I was somewhere, and somebody emailed me and said, hey, so-and-so helped me today with this, and I immediately got on the phone and said, I just got an email from so-and-so, and they said, you did a great job helping them. Just want you to know, I appreciate that. I appreciate you making HR look good. I appreciate you doing going beyond. I saw it in that message that that person sent me. Tell them. Tell them. <laughs> Stop holding it in. Stop reading and say, oh, that's good. Tell them. <laughs> tell them. Do what I want somebody to tell you. Think. Okay. Generation Z. This is the, this is the youngest group we have in the workplace. Diversity is their norm. They're the first digital natives. They've been, technology's been here since they were born. They're pragmatic and financially minded. They have some mental health challenges. We're dealing with a lot of this on our campus. With our, with our Generation Z, but not just Generation Z. We have it all through all of our generations. We see it, but these folks are a little bit more, um, I would say, anxious about things. There's some anxiety, there's some pressure that I, did, I have not seen in a lot of the earlier generations. And the pressure may be just from in the environment, it may be what's going on at home. I'm not really sure, I haven't, haven't done a lot of that research yet, but I will be. They're shrewd consumers. So when they go look for jobs or they look for things, they're gonna check it out for a while before they actually take it. I've got one girl right now. She's looking at she's looking at us and somebody. I'm like, the girl does not have a job. What are you looking at? I mean, it's like, it's like you, you you choose between nothing. I mean, you must come on and come work for us. So my team called her uh, over the last Friday and, and she said, well, she was supposed to start Monday the 25th. Today was supposed to be the first day. She said, well, can I just kick it out and start August first? And I just thought, tap back to him and said, she is working my nerves. But I'm going to, I mean, here's the thing. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to be patient with, with people because they need us. They need us. And even though they have foolish behavior, you know what I want to say? Girl, go on, bye. I want to tell her that. But I can't. Because you know what? That's somebody's child. It could be my child. It could be my niece. It could be my nephew. It could be somebody. And so I want to make sure that if she's going to come in a week, we're going to give her a chance to come in a week. Now, some people say, Sean, you're just crazy. And there we go. I'm not doing that. Because I need somebody to do that for my children. I would want somebody to do that for your children. We have to be patient with this, this next generation. They are true with consumers. So even with finding jobs, they're that way. So working with them, um, we want to highlight face to face communications. You definitely want to have regular check ins. These are the folks you want to check in all the time. I have a two, two a new Generation Z folks, and I have been reading this book called Don't Just Do What I Tell You, Do What Needs to Be Done. Y'all heard of that book? Don't just do what I tell you, do what needs to be done. Because here's what happens with Generation Z. They come in, they're like, I'm waiting on somebody to tell me what to do. Uh, the, pop, the pop machines need paper. You, you know, you can go in there and, and do all types of things. I try to give them assignments you can do when you're not having the phone ringing or something. What can you be doing? right? Organizing this space right here. There's a lot of things you can do, but a lot of times they haven't been taught how to work when nobody's telling you do X, Y, Z. So we have to create that kind of mindset in them. Make training and development a priority. You have to take the time with them and you have to find people that will give them the training that they need. And then for hiring and recruitment, start while they're in college. I was just, uh, Shelby County Schools has started hiring teachers in their third year. So in the third year, they're saying, hey, you're going to be a teacher for us. We're giving you a contract. You saw the contract before you got a diploma? <laughs> wow. Anyway, so they're doing that. So we need to start now earlier so we can pick those folks that we want in our workplaces. Channel their competitive natures. Carve out their career path. They're not a continuation of millennials. They are not like millennials. We can't just say, oh, they're all the same group. They're just young. Here's the thing. We have to ask the right questions of all of our generations. So leading them, 
they want high intensity relationships. So they need even more touches than, than Generation Y needs. We gotta get with them even more. So see what I'm saying? The, the manager, the supervisor role, you might be too tired for that. Because <laughs> this is gonna be a lot of work coming with these new generations coming up. I'm telling you, it's not for the faint of heart. You have to be ready for this next, they need you. Okay, they don't have it. They need training, they need lots of awards. They're used to everybody getting a trophy on the team. <laughs> so you gotta award them. And you can come up with different names for awards. Just like you had in high school, most popular, most funny. All, hey, do what you have to do to help the team move and, and grow. <coughs> dream positions, this is something I try to do in my office. The title is something that's, that, that entices her. Now, am I being a manipulative, a manipulative person? You may say that I am, but the reality is she wanted a dream job, I gave her one. She hadn't left me yet and I'm still growing her. She's not just sitting there like a knot on a log. You talk to her, she knows her stuff. She can, she can design some curriculum, right? So she's there. So when she wants that next level, guess what she can do? Go get it. She'll be ready. Promote diversity and inclusion. Prioritize mental health. I tell my team all the time. We have a, a mental health counselor on campus. You need to go see her. Go see her. It's, it, whatever, whatever you need to do to take care of your mental health, you do. All right. So, what do we need from the workplace to thrive for X, Y, and Z? Am I doing okay on time? Okay. You're great. All right. <laughs> One in five American workers have left the job due to work poor workplace culture. That was uh, the Sherman president, Dr. Johnny Taylor. They're quitting. How many of us uh, left the place due to workplace culture? Poor workplace culture. I sure have. Ran quick. I ran out there. Absolutely. They will leave if you do not create a culture where it is one where they can thrive. Not as they survive. If they can just pay their bills, that's not enough. They got to be seeing how this is going to help me pay. This is gonna help me pay off my house, pay off my car. That's what they're looking for. So we gotta reframe our attitude and perception on the generations. One of the major challenges within the um, multi-generational workforce is these preconceived notions. So we think, oh, because they're this, they're that. You know, watch people. That's why I work on projects with them, because even though they're in, I have people in certain generations, they're still different even within the generations. But when I work with them and I sit side by side and we share time and space and opportunity together, I learn about them as an individual. And then I can shape, I can shape what I'm gonna do for them. When I don't learn about them, I'm guessing. Or I'm making up something. Or I'm just throwing it out there. Wasting time? Wasting time. I don't have a minute to waste. Don't you say, then they say generation X don't waste my time. I don't waste time. It's too precious. So I try to make sure I am valuing that person and giving them exactly what they need. And I don't make any assumptions. Example, I was giving people award, I was giving people these financial awards. And I know one of my people is very shy. Her name is Brittany. I was gonna give her fifteen hundred dollars for a young professional group project she had done for, for the for her apartment. $1,500 check. So usually I do the publisher's clearinghouse check and get it at a big staff meeting or a bunch of people will see you get it. And I just said, Brittany's probably going to be embarrassed by that. So this is what I did. I went to her office. I said, Brittany, I want to reward you for the work you did on YPG, Young Professionals Group. And I said, I really think that I was thinking the publisher's clearinghouse check might not be what you want. She said, right. I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> she said, just write me a letter and don't tell anybody you gave it to me. I said, Sounds good to me. Now, that's not me, because look, I'm the girl who show up, show everybody what I got. Ooh, that's what I'm telling you, you're rewarding me. So for me, I would have won fanfare and, and praise and all this other stuff on the day that I did it. Okay. And, <laughs> and she said, I don't want that. Now, I could have said, I'll assume she wants it. I'm going to give it to her how I want to. But when I asked her, did that diminish the reward? No. But it made her happier because I didn't embarrass her and I didn't tell everybody that she got. For her, that's not important. 
what was important to her is that she got it and she and I knew what I had done for her, right? So again, think before you act. Ask yourself, let, have I spoken to that person? Have I, am I giving that person what they need or am I imposing what they need? This is one I try to do too, encourage cross-generational teams. And I've done a lot of work with my teams um, and you guys might wanna think about doing this um, and you may already do this, using a lot of what I call like self-awareness tools. So we do things like um, Myers-Briggs, of course, is a very popular one. Um, and then um, the um, Strength Finder, if you've done that one. A really cool one, if you've never done, is called Standout 2.0. It's, it's kind of the, the next level of um, Strength Finder. It's your two top roles. It's a really great um, instrument that you can use for your team to tell them where they really stand out at work. We've just finished that one at work, but LIFO is another one. There's a bunch of them. DISC, do some of those with people because they help you learn more about the individual themselves and yourself and how you engage that person to really get the maximum benefit for them. So I do a lot of that, and I always make people work with each other. So you can't be on my team and say, I can't work with someone, so that doesn't work for me, right? You're not gonna, you're gonna have to work with everybody because guess what, in the world, you're gonna have to work with who? Knuckleheads, people who you don't like, people who don't, don't do their part, people who don't step up to the plate. We see that all the time. So you as an HR professional can learn to work with anybody. You have to be able to do that. You don't like them, you might not trust them. You have to still learn how to work with people because that's essential. That's essential in our workplace. So rethinking culture and leadership, the equity part of it. We have to, we have to <laughs> try to be equitable. And, and I don't mean in this mean, mean that everybody gets the same thing. What I mean by this is everybody gets what they need what they need to be successful. So if you have, if I have a single mother that works for me and she needs to leave work at three o'clock to pick up her kids, because that's what she's gotten accustomed to during COVID, right? And I say, well, I can't let everybody else do that, so I can't let you do that. Uh-uh, uh-uh. That's not the answer anymore. The answer is, what do you need to be able to do this job to the best of your ability? You gotta be able to take care of your children first. If I can't take care of my babies, I'm quitting. <laughs> I'm going to quit the day I go pick up my baby and you said I could. I'm done with you. And I'm going to find another $40,000 job to go to. Because this one is not the one for me. My babies come first. We have to create a job where people can do it and have their life too. This next generation is not going. They ain't baby boomers. They're not staying all day and all night. They're not leaving somebody at home to cook. They're not doing that. They're going to be doing what they want to do when they need to do it. Okay. So we have to be able to provide this type of inclusive incentives and things that are equitable access. The other thing I do is I ask people, what is your next step? So if somebody tells me, Jason, how am I doing? Great. Okay, if I tell them my next step is, if they tell me their next step is they wanna be in a seat like mine. Here's what I do, and I have five people that have told me this on my team. So what I do with those five people is they get to experience the world of Shonda regularly. They get to go to meetings with me sometimes, and, and after they've gone with me like three times, I'm a, I just send them. I say, hey, go to Ken's meeting for me today. I've got a conflict. I've got a con conflict. And they'll know what to do, so I don't just say, go to the meeting and then hope they figure it out. No, I go and encourage them and say, see, when you come next time by yourself, if you have to come, this is what you have to do. And they're comfortable. So they get to experience the world of Chandra all the time. It's not a mysterious world. It's not a secret. <laughs> And I had to be out for a while. Do you know nothing got missed on my calendar? I had to be out for three weeks. My daughter um, got called into emergency surgery to have a baby in New Jersey. She wasn't supposed to go that early. I had to get on a flight that day. I didn't get to tell my team I'm leaving. I didn't get to prepare anybody. I had to go. But guess what happened? Everything kept moving. Nobody blinked. There wasn't a flinch because I'm preparing people behind me. Nobody did that for me. When I came in HR, I had three days with a guy. And I had to figure it out. I said, I will never, never, never do a team like that. Never. And don't you do it. Prepare the people behind you. Stop hoarding that work. Stop calling up the people. that you have, 
they will, they will, I'm telling you, you cannot buy the praise and, and, the, and the adulation you'll have. You can't buy it. People will love you. They love me, y'all, because they know they can do this job. I'm not hogging anything. I don't need to. I need to prepare people to do this job. So if I fall off the face of the earth, HR keeps moving smoothly, and nobody misses me. I'm okay with that. I'm securing myself. Get some security. Get some self-assurance. Get some confidence. They need us to let them come and do these jobs and be ready for them. Right now, and I'm going to tell you this. There are, and I'm finishing at 9. You're good. Okay. You got to go 9.30. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a wonderful job. Okay. Tell her right now. <laughs> have a dean that retires or someone leaves, we don't have somebody ready to go in that spot. I'm sick of that. I'm sick of it. You can be a dean. You can be a vice chancellor, but you won't train somebody to be the next dean? What's wrong with you? We have to have people in the pipeline ready to go. I remember years ago, we had a guy on our board. His name was Shannon Brown. He was the Chief Operations Officer at FedEx. And we were doing a search for one of our deans, and we asked him to be on the search. And Shannon is a, a who, if you know him, you'll know what I'm talking about. But Shannon said, I don't understand this hire anything. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Why don't y'all train up people to go in FedEx? They say, if you are in our operations pool, we're going to train you to do the next thing, whatever it might be. And they have five, ten people prepared to go into roles. We don't do that in higher ed. Do you do it? Do you have people ready to, in your pipeline? Are you preparing them? Why don't we do that? We're not that busy, y'all. You got to do it anyway. Take somebody with you. Bring them. Train them with you. Empower your employees. Ensure equitable benefits. That's the other thing. When I get to, OK, I just got promoted in March, all right? So now I sit at the chancellor's table. I'm there with the people that's making all those decisions. So years ago, I used to say, I wish they would do this. I wish they would do that. Guess who they is now? <laughs> <laughs> so guess what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to squander my seat at the table. Ooh. I'm not going to squander my seat at the table. I might get put out the table. But here's the thing. I'm going to use this opportunity to try to bring equitable benefits. We have a power. We have so many policies that are so weird. So we have this one called um, bereavement leave. So you get bereavement. If your mother dies, you get five days. If your child dies, if your spouse dies. But what if I wasn't ready? I, I adopted three kids, right? They also have foster moms. They have other moms that have been in their lives. If one of their foster moms dies, guess what they get? Zero days to mourn their foster mom. Some of my kids have had more than, than one foster mom. That was their mother. Our policy, they would get nothing for that lady who took care of them for five years of their life. I have two children that live with late for five years. That's their mother. That's somebody who was with them in the formative years. But my policy says you can go more than that lady for three or four or five days. You get nothing for her. It's crazy. You've got to change that. Same sex, we don't do anything for that. None of our policies address same sex, anything. Why? That's not equitable access to things. We have to give equitable access. Policies have, uh, they're, they're wrong. We just have to. I mean, there, there's nothing to say. You're, I may have a personal belief, right? But I'm talking about people belief. We got to think about the people around us because there are a lot of them that are coming into the workplace and that are in the workplace that need us to be equitable. Reevaluate our equity practices. Remember when I told you I allow people to do things? See, the other thing we try to do is we try to say, well, and, and I'm biased. I know I'm biased, right? I might not want to admit that I'm biased, but I ain't. So what I try to do is anybody who wants to shadow and do this job, I don't try to say, well, you're just not, you're just too, mm -mm, you can't do this. I don't think so-and-so can do it. I don't judge because guess what? I'm not perfect. And I haven't really figured out what's wrong. I don't, I don't, I don't have the answer to what's wrong with people. You know what I'm saying? So I try to give everybody the opportunity, no matter who they are or no matter my experiences with them. If, if they have done something
that I didn't like, I still give them the opportunity because they could be the next person that's the best person for that job. So again, when you evaluate your equity practices, make sure you are not being biased. Give everybody chances, even if you don't like them. And to say you don't like somebody, I think that's very interesting as a manager. So you might need to evaluate yourself. Here's one thing I try to always do. I may not like something you have done, but I try to find the good in everybody. And y'all, I have had to fire people. All my, all my 10 years of career in HR, I've had to fire people. But I fired them with dignity. And even the people that, that are in the room, I had a guy one time, his wife, something was going on with her. And he and she, I was, I was coming to tell her she was gonna be terminated. She had done some things, uh, she was a nurse, and she had done some things that giving people wrong medication. Not stuff that like, you know, just we didn't like them, but stuff that was dangerous, right, dangerous. And so we, we had to let her go, and he was sitting there looking at me like he could have cut me with his eyes. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, I understand. And, and he and I had gone back, he had worked with us too, and his wife, before. he had already retired, but she was, she was still working. So we had to let her go, and he was in the meeting, and I said, you know, I'm sorry this is happening, but we've got to do this. And so about a year passed, and he hit me up on LinkedIn about a year later. And he said, Chandra, I just want to let you know that after we left you all that day, um, it didn't happen immediately. He said, but about three months later, we found out that she had dementia. You all had seen the signs before we did, but we began to see it when we had her at home every day. He said, I want to apologize for how I acted in your office. And I want to tell you, I've thought about you a lot of days since then. This is what he said in his note. I've thought about you a lot of days since then about how I treated you that day. And he said, I didn't know. He said, but you knew. You, I didn't know she had dementia. I just knew she wasn't doing her job, right? And she was, she was causing <laughs> harm. She could have caused harm to people with some of the things she did. But if you do the right thing with the right spirit, people will come forward and they will say, okay, I understand why you did what you did. So I feel like the, the affirmations I've had over the years taught me, tell the truth. Even when somebody's staring at you and they want to cut you with the knife that they do. <laughs> tell the truth. Have the police there. <laughs> no, I always have security. Always have security. You never know when somebody's going to pull something out of their purse or out of their bag or out of their belt. So I always have security there, but I tell the truth. And it's hard, y'all. It's very hard. It's very hard. So rethink our culture of leadership with transparency. We have to set clear expectations. <laughs> One of the things when our, when our team first comes on, on board, I believe in, in having expectations for every part of the job. So I even tell people how I want them to answer the phone. You may say, well, Sean, that's just too much. I don't care what you think. <laughs> but when you call HR, I want you to hear something. I want you to hear the name of the person you're speaking to and where you called. You might call the wrong office. It would be hello. <coughs> no. Good afternoon, human resources. This is Brandy. May I help you? So I teach the very basics to my people. The expectations for my folks are crystal clear. What time are you supposed to be at work? How do I expect you to do your hybrid schedule? All of that's very clear. We're talking through this regularly to make sure they're on track. It's not going to, you're not going to have to wonder with Chandra. You're going to know. People don't want to wonder anymore. They want to make sure they're, they're meeting your expectations. Share your failures, not just your successes. Be vulnerable and humble. I'll tell you, people call me, they'll catch me somewhere, and they say, hey, Chandra, um, I wanted to pick up dental insurance. How much is dental insurance? Like, do I look like I'm walking around with the HR handbook on in my right? I don't know, but I know somebody who does know. I have, mil I have 20 experts on my team, other than myself. They can tell you everything. So I don't try to hoard all the knowledge. I don't, and I don't do that. This, I can't, this really irks me. When somebody's calls, Debbie, how much is dental insurance? Oh, dental insurance, like you knew. You didn't know. <laughs> I tell the truth to that person. I say, you know what, I don't know everything. And that's one thing I don't have committed to memory. So let me do this. Let me set you up with Debbie, and then she can go over anything you might want to know about dental insurance. Because I'm not going to be able to do it right here on the spot in this meeting that has nothing to do with dental insurance. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want you to get what you need. So I'm going to be, I'm going to tell you that. And then I'm going to teach you how to go to the people on my team that have what you need. And stop coming to me because I don't have the what you need all the time. 
Um, I'm vulnerable. I try to do that all the time. I try to tell them, it took me seven years to finish my doctorate. Some people finish in three and four and all that. I don't care. I finished. I wasn't the smartest person. I had to do two dissertations. They told me the first one, you can't do that's not good. That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> okay. I had to go back to the drawing board. I perfect. I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. And I'm gonna make my team came in one time. They were so scared because y'all, I'm, I'm I'm just like this at work. So I'm like over over the top. So they came to me and said, Shonda, we don't think you need to fire this girl. That did, uh, I forgot what it was she had done. And, and, and they said, I said, well, why wouldn't I need, why, tell me why I don't need to fire her. And they told me why. I said, you know what? That makes sense. Let's go with what y'all just said and let's meet with her and talk about that. I will listen. I will change my mind. I am wrong. I make wrong decisions. I need them to help me not go over the ledge. But you know what some managers, that, what people will do? They'll watch you make the wrong decisions and laugh at you behind your back because they don't like you and you haven't been good to them. But they won't do that to Chandra because they're going to catch me because they know I've told them I'm not perfect. I need you and I trust you and I want you to trust me. So how can I get that from you? So we have to be people that others want to help and not trip up. I know the, I, I mean, I have leaders on the, on that board, you know, now I'm on the vice chancellor board. I mean, the vice president type board and I'm there. There, there's some folks that, that have done some things that I know are wrong. There are people that, uh, and then this is something I don't want you to do either, is uh, I'll be somewhere and, and they know me. They'll come to me and speak to me and I'll have my team, a couple of my team members or a couple other employees standing next to me. They won't speak to them. Like, don't you see these two living, breathing human beings next to me? Can you speak to them? Introduce yourself, tell them who you are. You are not that important that you can't speak to people. I can't wait till I have that conversation. And I will be happy. <laughs> because that's not the way you treat people on campus. They, my team said it to me. They said, you saw how they, how they spoke to you and then speak to us. I said, I saw that. But now, I wasn't at the table then, but I'm at the table now. Yeah. So when they come around next time, I say, did you speak to these two people here? Yeah. And y'all know I'm bold enough to do it. I'm not scared. <laughs> you going to fire me? Go for it. I'll go find somewhere else to work. I'm like, love people, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to mistreat people and be a leader in front of me anymore. I'm at the table with you. We're going to treat people the way they need to be treated at this campus. We have to be humble as well. And humility is something that you can't lie. I mean, man, I wish I could pour it into some people. <laughs> but humility, being an humble spirit, knowing that you don't know everything, knowing that you don't have the answer, that is so important as a leader. Knowing that and letting your team know that. Boy, they love you so much when they know you know you're not hurt. When they know you're fallible and you hurt and you don't have what you wanted. Somebody under-promised you. Be consistent. When I talk about being consistent, um, I try to walk the walk. So my, my job, I could probably work hybrid every day mm. if I wanted to. So I go to work every day. I go to the office every day. It's important for me to be there because I need to be there if they need me. I need to be there if they, to see me and to see my presence. I could take advantage of it. And I know leaders who do that. They work hybrid and their whole team comes in. That's something I'm about to take care of too. I'm gonna to talk to these teams. Cause see, we, we're coming out of COVID now. There was, there was a time when I was kind of leaving you alone, but I'm gonna to talk to them about that. Your behavior, people are watching you. We have to be consistent and we have to show what we expect. See, do I expect my, my people to come in every day? No, I, I appreciate that I allow them to have their hybrid schedules, but they need me. And I'm being paid those extra coins to be there to help them. So again, whatever people want from the workplace, flexible and hybrid work schedules, but that requires some critical skills and competencies. People need to be able to work on a schedule without somebody saying, answer the phone. So this is what I tell my team. This is, so, this is so fun to do this with them. I said, you know what? If I get one complaint, I didn't get a call back, nobody emailed me, they didn't help me, I wouldn't ask anybody on the phone. You're coming back to work eight to five Monday through Friday. It's easy for me. 
<laughs> service first. If you serve the people and I don't get any complaints, I'm not going to bother your schedule. If I start getting complaints, guess what I'm going to do? All this is going to change. Do y'all know what? They are so quick. <laughs> somebody called, I called the front desk and nobody answered. It went to voicemail. I never better call the front desk and nobody answered. And so I sent an email to the whole team. I said, I just called the front desk and did not get an answer. I got 15 emails back in one second. And they said, I'm at the front desk and we had just installed Ring Central. How many people know what Ring Central is? That came from hell. <laughs> Promote 
body tolerance for risk taking? Can you tolerate taking a chance on what I'm asking you to do? Let's just do it for a year and see how it works. Let's do an engagement survey at the beginning and the end and see how it works. Making performance management more about collaborative performance. So if you can't work with everybody else, you can't work on this team. Your performance management is dictated by you being able to work across the lines. You got to work across the state. We have people in Knoxville, Nashville, uh, Chattanooga. If you can't work with people across the state, that's a problem for me. We have to be able to work collaboratively. That's part of your performance management. Can you work with others effectively? If you cannot, guess what? You're not going to be able to continue in this workplace. And then adapting rewards to promote desired behaviors. So don't give, don't give rewards for something you don't like, for behaviors you don't like. I see people do that all the time. We had a, we had a guy, I'm on a nonprofit board, and um, the guy that's uh, the ED of our, of our board, he's doing okay, but he's got some problems with the staffing and some problems with some um, other things. And so the, the past board chair wanted to give him like all these fives and all these high scores. I said, uh uh. Didn't we just talk to him about this? Didn't we just do an exit interview with an employee that told us he wasn't even having a staff meeting? So you don't give somebody all fives and then I have a staff meeting. And then they don't even have the confidence of the staff. You don't give them all fives? Stop. Think. We have to give good feedback so we can get what we want. If we give them all fives, guess what you're gonna do? Keep doing the same thing he's been doing. But if you get a two out of five and you're not meeting expectations and we ask you, ask you to do something, Guess what you're going to try to do? I'm going to try to move this two up to a five. I better do what they asked me to do. People need to, the, the rewards and the awards need to match what the behavior is that you want. Don't keep checking the boxes of five because you're because you lazy or, you, or you're just scared or you don't have courage to tell the truth. Don't do that for people. That's not helping them. I know it's hard, but try to, try to be honest. Why purpose is important. People want to live and work their purpose. Purpose is the antidote to uncertainty. One of the biggest companies that we compete with in Memphis is St. Jude. Purpose, ooh, they have, they win every award in Memphis. Their employees are all in because of that purpose. When people have purpose, that Debbie Long, if I show you the one that's IF Psychology for me, she has a purpose, y'all. And so she's all in. When you create purpose in people and they match, you cannot stop them. They are there. They are, they, they are so excited to come to work. On Sunday, they're like, ooh, when is Monday coming? I'm so excited to be there. Having purpose helps us overcome obstacles. And it improves our well-being because we're moving towards something that we enjoy and that we want to do. Find purpose for X, Y, and Z. They need that. We need that. So what do we need again from the workplace, from the workplace to thrive? I told you. Leaders who provide, develop, and support equity, not just equality, but what I need as an individual. Transparency, tell me like it is. I need to know the truth, and I need to know more than just the surface. Flexibility, how I work, how my organization, my organization can be flexible and agile, and then I need purpose. That's what I need moving forward from you. Thank you. Thank you.